I, I just thought I'd, I'll try to start with something simple. Um, and that is because um, at least three of you, uh, Hito, Anton, and Arseni, are having specific interest in thinking through the changing yeah, status and role of the museum. And uh, it seems, I mean, for me, a picture, in, in, as a non specialist, um, uh, like some others here, but definitely speaking to a lot of specialists also, um, it's as a non-specialist, Cosmos, the image of Cosmism that has emerged not so much out of the exhibition, which I would like to discuss separately, but out of this uh, day and a half conference is definitely as a kind of border delirium that is at times equally beautiful and equally scary. Um, and the uh, someone of, uh, always situated at a dialectical tipping point. Um, and I'd like to return to that later, but in the case of the museum, it seems obviously at this dialectical tipping point of total conservation and total transformation. Um, but th that's what I mean with delirious, because you kind of quite can't quite get your head, at least I can't quite get my head around how, how this uh, particular dream of the museum as the institution, you know, of the state, for instance, that is, as Boris said, ought to become the museum of its population, you know? um, where, of course, immediately the whole uh, cosmist dream becomes haunted by specters of eugenics, as you brought up, etc., you know, like a question of what is that curatorial project, if it is one, as you suggest of course, haunted by the question of selection, who to re resurrect first, under what circumstances, etc. Um, but also just in, in terms of this inherent, now to, to kind of wanting to hear you quickly on the question of the museum, um, where, where do you situate that role of the museum in relation to this uh, particular uh, delirium that we might have to work through again, as it seems, uh, for reasons that I think um, were made clear by several speakers today. In particular, I can just refer to Trevor's uh, um, question of this main, you know, canonic theme in cosmism, obviously the conquest of time, that is at the same time the undoing of time, that somehow in the museum, first of all, manifests as taking things out of time. No? So that you have this kind of question of externality and imminence um, that is similarly instable in its dialectics. I don't know if, Arseni, you want to speak a little bit about your vision of having worked through avant-garde museology and the Soviet museum, of what, where do you see that institution in relation to your talk and uh, into the contemporary situation? Yes, of course, uh, museum has always uh, Mm, consider it as uh, uh, part of this dialectic between death and uh, resurrection, because uh, usually uh, even Anton said about that that we may say that cosmism is still alive because there are so many different opinions, uh, so it's not uh, bureaucratized, so it's not uh, uh, put into museum, into archive, so it's still. <clears throat> provoke something. And um, for artists in general, since avant-garde, uh, when one says that uh, um, something should go to museum, means that it's, this something is already dead. And um, on the other hand, uh, there is a completely different, opposite vision of the museum and art um, that is uh, much stronger, substantially stronger than ordinary life. And uh, this intensivity of life can be um, produced only by museum itself and um, uh, its uh, particular conditions. So uh, if, uh, if we speak about transformation of this institution, in, in, in my opinion, I consider it as kind of like evolution from this um, very closed institution where um, only a few people can uh, enjoy their, I don't know, richness and uh, their dead uh, 
capital, let's say, so um, uh, becoming a place where uh, happens something else, not already even art, but uh, for example, in case of Museum of Revolution, uh, it's already kind of like part of life, but with um, uh, uh, with a particular type of display that we have in case of exhibitions. And then needless to say that um, museum uh, in case of uh, Russian Kasmism uh, starts even after that, after, after any uh, possible uh, uh, discussion about uh, about death or about any possible discussion of, um, uh, for example, uh, again, to um, to mention this topic of sexual relationship that uh, sexual relationship for cosmists were considered as um, attempt to uh, get victory over death. So after that, only um, museum in uh, Russian Kasmism um, starts. And um, I don't uh, <laughs> know what I can add more, but maybe mm -hmm. just to uh, back to Hitler's idea of montage, for example, in my case, uh, uh, I don't work with uh, video, but montage in my case, it's like uh, directly, it's like spatial montage of different types of time because museum, for me, it's a spatial expression of time. And um, it's nice that we can, um, even through just moving around the different art pieces, different angles of the uh, museum, um, get this, uh, absolutely different um, impression of time, as uh, Trevor put it, as like kind of landscape, like spatial landscape, and um, yeah. So I guess uh, because of that uh, too, it's really really important for me. Anton, do you like to maybe describe the choice of museums for the third film of the trilogy? Uh, yeah, sure. They, they were quite specific. I'm, the, the main one with, the, uh, with the, all of the animals uh, is the Museum of Zoology. It's a very old museum. It's actually, I think it's the oldest museum in Russia, uh, dating back to 1780s or something like that. And it's very close to the library where Fedorov worked. So uh, while I don't know for sure, but I think that it's quite likely that he may have visited it. And uh, um, it, it's also a museum that has not been changed significantly. Yeah, I think that the same taxidermic displays uh, are still there. Basically, these animals are quite old, and uh, so it for me it was just kind of very interesting to film there to understand, you know, the spaces that may have inspired him to, to come up with some of these ideas. Uh, but also the other muse uh, museum is, of course, the Tretikov Gallery, where the collection of avant-garde is, which is a rather small room hidden in the back, and it's very, very clear that the museum does not really like or care about its collection of avant-garde, and it's also completely empty. Nobody really goes there because, uh, uh, yeah, it's strange. So you, it, it, it was very easy to film there because there were, there were no visitors. Yeah. Uh, then there was Museum of Revolution, which is now being changed into the Museum of the History of Russian Federation, I believe, right? Is that what it's going to be called? But the Museum of Revolution is a totally fascinating place because this is the closest that uh, I think c comes to a kind of a visualization of a Fedorovian Museum of Everything because a Museum of Revolution kind of preserves anything from, you know, yeah, portraits of Lenin to, to incidental objects, to weapons, to, you know, photographs and all sorts of stuff, anything pertaining to the topic of the October Revolution. Um, and the fourth space, which was actually very, very important, was the Lenin Library, uh, specifically the catalog room of the Lenin Library, where the index cards for its entire holdings were located, yeah. Uh, Lenin Library is actually a kind of an extension of the library where Fedorov worked at, which was Romantsev Library, which then evolved into the central library of the Soviet Union, 
which has a collection of, I th think, maybe a couple, up to two million books, yeah, which you can only find by using this index card. So there is a space uh, that's quite large with, um, th which is kind of like the, the brain of this entire place, yeah. And, uh, and basically, I think it may not exist anymore because uh, the new director of the library system suddenly decided to digitize everything, yeah? But of course, like, the, the fear is that the way people digitize things, they're quite sloppy, so probably in the process of di digitization, they will lose track of a, a significant amount of uh, the content of the library. So, and so everything is changing. The Museum of Revolution is becoming something else the library is potentially going to be moved out of its building and the catalog room is going to be a computer somewhere else. Uh, the animals are still uh, preserved though and I think maybe this is the, the, the one museum that will have longevity because it's incredibly popular with children, yeah. I was quite surprised how many visitors it has. Um, and uh, yeah, Tretikov Gallery is going through transformations as well, so. I was going. I was thinking to myself somehow that the the things that seem to haunt this uh, discourse, um, among others, also I mean include the kind of question of what one could perhaps call you know magical thinking or savage thought, and it's somehow something that became clear to me in the moment, Trevor, you spoke about. Um, the American space program and its uh, uh, association with colonial frontier and its mythology. Um, but somehow, you know, then when we are transported back into the 19th century, this is exactly the moment of the kind of closing of the front colonial frontier. No? So the, the, the kind of cosmist thought also emerges at the closing of the colonial frontier. And that somehow makes a certain very typical export gesture of these functions of magical thinking and the, what it does to the boundary between things and science and the capacity of science to create things, to conjure them up or to create them in a kind of mythopoetic act of creation, um, was exported before that closure typically to whatever was uh, termed primitive, savage, etc., no? um, which is, uh, has a long tradition of uh, um, being sort of exported into that realm where that magic creation was possible and had a certain use value at the same time that, of course, also the avant-garde were always dreaming of in terms of uh, uh, their own versions of uh, the dream of a utilitarian art. Um, now, I'm just thinking, um, when we are having this when we are thinking of this question of um, how the difference between the cosmist thought and the American space program um, looks to us today, if you could maybe just expand a little bit about your thoughts about that. Also in relation to, you know, one thing you've brought up that I thought was, I was just answering, asking myself is like, so if we are now surrounded by this massive amount of time-bending technologies, does that come close or is that radically different from that sort of dream of mastery over time, right? Um, is that exactly a loss of control? Um, are we at this exact dialectical tipping point here as well? Or is that actually a tool of, of arriving at that sort of dream of of inducing consciousness into the blindness of natural law, etc. Okay, That's, those are three big questions. <laughs> um, just as a, a quick note on that idea of the frontier, Fedorov is, was very highly influenced by some experiments that were done in the US that he was aware of, of trying to make rain with cannons, right? So there was, I don't know exactly what it was, but there were some experiments where they were shooting stuff into the clouds and trying to make rain. And this, for Fedorov, was an incredibly important idea that these military technologies should be appropriated towards geoengineering, right? Engineering the planet. Um, on the question of space, what, I think the thread that you see, I've always wondered like why, you know, even like Soviet stories like Solaris, 
were so different than American science fiction. Like in Solaris, you go in, the astronauts go to the different planet, and the different planet tries to communicate with them, but it tries to communicate with them through their memories and you know, their family members who had died and stuff like that. And it kind of turn, becomes almost kind of a horror story, but, there is, like, but that's what that is. Like going into space is going into one's ancestry. The alien is the, the, the thing that, that, that haunts your own history or what have you. So there's, there's that much more of this mirror-like relationship, which is far more far foregrounded in that tradition. And I think that that very directly comes from this kind of cosmist um, aesthetic, right? And, it, it, and it's, that's just not NASA. That's not Star Trek. It's like the exact opposite of Star Trek in a certain, a certain way, right? Um, in this question of the time bed new technologies, um, I guess the way that I think about that, okay, so a kind of fundamental thing that Fedorov is interested in is what are the, what is the ethical framework within which technologies should be deployed and towards which human, and that human production should be put in the service of, right? And he's very clearly kind of anti-capitalist or trying to think of some version of like, super cosmological communism or something like that would, would be something akin to what he would be talking about. Um, and I guess that's the way that I think about when we look at time-bending technologies, which has been very much, you know, that have been very uh, used quite dramatically since the 19th century. I guess I think to think about them crudely as instruments of capital, right? And so we um, think about the ability to bend time is the ability to bring, you know, um, interval, uh, yeah, to produce time in the service of, of circuits of capital, whether that is transportation or whether that is, you know, saving all your metadata and then trying to sell you Crocs or whatever the fuck it is, right? Um, and so I think the question then is, okay, what would that, what would a post-capitalist um, use of time-bending technologies be? I guess for me that's one of the interesting questions that is provoked. I don't know what it is, but I actually think that's a relevant question and an important one, just even for doing mundane stuff like articulating like data storage policy or things like that. Yeah, I think one could also understand Solaris uh, also in that context. No? In a way it is also, of course a powerful symbol of this um, magic that I was, I mean, of this, because I think, if I remember right, it kind of augments what it copies, no? It is exactly sort of uh, that mythopoeic power uh, exported, <laughs> um, but also somehow rendered, uh, rendered alien and imminent at the same time, no? And, but also... Um, uh, uh, Why uh, add something sure. on the same thing? Uh, when, I, when um, you ask about the um, difference between Soviet and American space program, first movie that uh, um, came to my mind was, wasn't Solaris, but uh, Interstellar. And uh, Interstellar is kind of banner of uh, new interest to cosmos, A extremely popular, super well-made uh, film with uh, deep, deep uh, uh, scientific um, uh, invention that was uh, introduced into, but the plot is um, mm, interesting mm, even because of the characters, because um, the main character is a peasant, and uh, uh, his uh, cosmic journey uh, started when um, he realized that uh, Earth is dead, that uh, he could not be peasant anymore, and there is a uh, connection mm, there is no more connection between human and the earth because of ecological crisis. And uh, because of that, uh, humanity decided to spread uh, um, in, uh, in outer space and uh, try to find another planet for colonization. And uh, in my mind, <clears throat> from the one hand, it has many similarities to Fedorov because he was a uh, kind of supporter of peasants, first of all, not proletarians. And um, on the other hand, uh, which is interesting, that uh, uh, probably uh, we are coming to this 
possible solution, you know, for ecological crisis. Uh, but for cosmic, uh, cosmic uh, it was not a good solution because if uh, you are going to destroy uh, one planet, possibly you will destroy another one, etc., etc. So um, I don't think that uh, this is the main difference because I guess this uh, uh, worrying about uh, ecological catastrophe and possible decision in looking for another planet uh, uh, is important for both um, cosmic. Uh, countries, but um, what uh, cosmic uh, thinkers could add to this discussion is that um, maybe responsibility to to nature in order to uh, for, for um, you know, responsibility that was imp important for uh, cosmic exploration. Let's see. I mean, it's maybe closely connected to yet another one of these tipping points, which is sort of between, you know, the search for Can overcoming. I react to that? Can yeah, I react to that? I'd just like to okay. ask you, okay. uh, push you in a little you direction. Okay, good. Yeah. Push. No, because I, I <laughs> thought it was relating to what you did uh, with the <laughs> excerpt we have seen, um, is connected to this kind of, you know, the end of time and origin, the tale. Um, being eaten, etc. Of course, I have somehow this relationship to the dreams of overcoming alienation, intimately being bound with, with also the the idea of of what it means to imagine a society pre divisions, pre the grand divisions that are being deliriously overcome here, but always somehow in this uncertain tipping point. Right? So I was wondering, Hito, if you could speak a little bit about this relation between the non-alienated at the promise of overcoming alienation and hyper-alienation that I think you hinted to in the kind of montages you suggested. Okay, I will try, but please let me first, you know, make a very simple remark. Um, I think that probably there's, I mean, from my point of view, there is much less difference between the Soviet and US um, realities of space imagination today because even before the end of the Cold War they both started shrinking um, and decaying and being privatized and coming onto the spell of you know venture capital and you know of private cryonic investors and whatnot. So I think in that sense they are both more similar than different. And the, there's the same basically historical movement in both. And I would be very curious, and I have no idea, I, I have no idea how to do this, but the only space system that seems to be functional is the Chinese one, and it seems to have somehow you know, digested all these transformations. So this would really be an interesting thing to discuss and include next time. But I think that this idea you know, of uh, leaving Earth and inhabiting Mars and whatnot is precisely an expression of this massive deadlock, you know, that this state of capital relation produces. There is this deadlock that, you know, uh, you seem to be able to now biologically maybe very soon overcome mortality, but you cannot change anything in the real existing world. So basically the idea of escaping to Mars seems to me to express precisely the deadlock that we cannot change anything in this world. And this is also, you know, it seems to be more plausible to imagine like Elon Musk that we live in a world um, that is a simulation made by aliens, you know, then actually to go, go out somewhere and do the same thing that uh, the guy wants to do in Interstellar or, you know, uh, Matt Damon does in The Martian, you know, just defecate somewhere and turn this into arable land to produce something. This seems to be absolutely impossible. It seems to be more plausible that we live in a computer game produced by aliens. And I think this is this this maybe to relate it back to this idea about alienation. You know, maybe we need to alienate even more. The absolutely alien idea is to shit somewhere and to make something out of it. And we need even to reach this point of complete alienation and make it real for anything to change. 